Hey there guys, alright, today we are back with some more of The Great War, this time week 29, stopping Russia. Hindenburg's final offensive? I don't think Hindenburg was done fighting yet. Uh, I thought he served throughout the war, but perhaps I was wrong. Before we dive into the video though, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box, we'd love it if you join the Discord. Now that all that, now that we got the community stuff out of the way, go ahead and just dive right into the video. In just over six months, this war has spiraled out of control and spread all over the world, producing millions of casualties and shocking the world with its almost unimaginable scale of death and brutality. People in every country hoped for it to end, for the men to come home and come home alive, but they were to be disappointed, certainly this week, for not one, not two, but three huge offensives involving well over a million soldiers were in oh, full no. swing this week. I'm assuming every single one of these offensives is going to go bad. I'm Andy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. Last week, we saw the Ottoman Empire try and fail to take the Suez Canal. The Germans and Russians clashed in Bolimov, where the Germans attempted and failed to release a large-scale gas attack. A combined German-Austrian offensive on a massive scale was underway against the Russians in the Carpathian Mountains, and Kaiser Wilhelm gave his blessing to unrestricted submarine warfare, where any ship could be torpedoed at any time. Now that would later have a huge effect on the war and the course it followed, but for now, let's look to the mountains, where submarines have no place. The Austro-Hungarian Imperial Army- Wait, y'all never heard of the mountain subs? Oh, come on. Very crucial to war. Army, ...under Chief of Staff Konrad von Hotzendorf continued its Carpathian Winter Offensive this week. This offensive began two weeks ago, and though the Austrian army made a reasonable amount of progress at times, this offensive really highlighted the enormous problems facing that army. Now, we've looked at a few of them, but one we really see here in the mountains is the failure to mount coordinated assaults. Individual units would attack enemy positions without communicating with their neighbors, and commanding officers would occasionally ignore direct orders to coordinate their attacks, at oh, least God. until it was too late to do any good. The Russians, especially the Siberian troops, were far more used to the terrain and the freezing weather, and were tactically superior here. Their counterattacks were expertly timed, but they were also exceptionally good at retrograde attacks, where they would retreat from their positions at the last moment and then re-establish themselves, which had the effect of forcing the Austrian troops to remain in battle formations in the freezing weather. In fact, Pretty much everything the Russians did wreaked attritional havoc on the woefully unprepared and under-equipped Austrian army. What I love mo what I'm loving most about this series is that Russia does get uh, dogged on for having a shitty military, and while they do have shitty leaders, uh, what this series is really highlighting, though, is that uh, Russia wasn't the worst. Russia was actually fairly competent, it seems, for honestly a decent length of time throughout this war. Um, which is not something really it's talked about, right? Because uh, I feel like I think it's definitely popular to dog on the Russian military. And while I certainly agree with certain sentiments, because the Russian military is not as good as. Some people think it has been throughout history. Um, it's not awful, you know. It's average, I guess you could say. Uh, I mean, one of the biggest problems plaguing the Russian military is its shot size. Its size. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm loving that this series is really tackling the whole, like, showcasing the Russian, like really showcasing like. Uh, Military incompetency uh, across all nations. And I love it. Army. But give the Austrians credit, they still managed to perform well when it came to the actual fighting. On the 6th, they recaptured Kim Po Lung, and throughout the week, they reached and advanced in Bukovina. And at the end of the week, as the temperature dropped 20 degrees below zero, yeah. both they and the Russians began pouring men into the region as the battles intensified. But the Austrians had now lost 100,000 men, and they were slowly becoming outnumbered. And lest we forget, further to the northwest, on the River San, lay the true Austrian goal. 
the fortress of Przemysl, where an entire army, over 100,000 strong, has been under siege in enemy territory for months, awaiting relief. The Russians may have tactical advantages in the mountains to the south, but they most certainly did not far to the north. This week saw the beginning of the second Battle of the Masurian Lakes. See, back in August and early September, the Russians had been crushed by the Germans at Tannenberg and the first Battle of the Lakes and driven out of East Prussia. This new battle, which was the brainchild of General von Hindenburg, was not just supposed to be a mere battle. <laughs> Yo, I love that art piece. That's some, that's some funny propaganda there. I like it. But was to force Russia out of the war and close the Eastern Front. That was von Hindenburg's plan anyhow. German Army Chief of Staff Erich von Falkenhayn was reluctant to commit forces to it, believing firmly that the war was to be won in the West. But in the end, he felt that a strong offensive against Russia would have a favorable impact on potential allies in the Balkans. So he gave the green light. On February 7th, 1915, in a fierce snowstorm, the German 8th Army attacked, hoping to gain the element of surprise against the southern wing of the Russian forces. This worked out big style, and the Russians were rapidly pushed back over 100 kilometers in the course of a week, taking heavy Dang. casualties. On February 9th, the German 10th Army attacked from the north against the Russian right flank, threatening to encircle the Russian forces, and the Russians were now in disorderly retreat. As the days wore on, tens of thousands of Russians were taken captive, including 10,000 in one day on February 10th near Kovno. Yet another winter offensive was also in full swing over on the Western Front, as the Champagne Offensive, which had been going on since before Christmas, continued. And there it was business as usual. The fighting continued heavily throughout the week at Bagatelle in the Argonne. Here's something though that might break the monotony of hearing each and every week about the endless offensives on the mm. Western Front where hundreds of thousands of men would die in a three day battle for 15 yards of trench lines. A side note you might find interesting, thanks to historian Martin Gilbert. On February 12th, the very same day Kaiser Wilhelm was drawing up target lists for strategic bombing raids against Britain, a French refugee was being interviewed in Britain. Her name was Mademoiselle de Bettignies, and she was willing to return to Lille, where she lived, and send information as a spy for Britain. Mm. She went back disguised as a nun and lived in a convent where radio equipment was smuggled to her in pieces. The generator she needed to power the radio was really noisy though, so she received her orders by radio, but sent her information back by pigeon. She managed a steady stream of information for two months, until she was arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment. Oh. She died in September 1918. Oh. Now we haven't seen or talked much about spies so far, so I thought it would be something worth mentioning. That's actually really cool. I appreciate it. Further to the south, we see post-offensive action as the Turks retreat from their defeat at the Suez Canal. Heavy dust storms prevent them from being followed. And on February 9th, the British close the canal to neutral nations. And that's the way Europe looks just before Valentine's Day 1915. The Russians and the Austro-German forces duking it out in the Carpathians. The advantage inexorably turning to Russia. The Germans, French and British still dying in droves for gains of a few meters in Champagne. And the Russians in the north on the run in chaos from two German armies in East Prussia. It's interesting to talk about spies here, not just because spies are interesting, which they are, but because yeah. we're talking on an individual level. We don't seem to do that so often since that's not how this war is, this world war. And think, when I tell a tale of heroism or an everyday tale from the trenches that may inspire or entertain. What of the ones I don't mention? All of the other soldiers. They have their stories too. Whether they be the brief tale of the 19 year old being killed by a sniper his first day in battle because he peeked over the top of his trench. Or the 40 year old veteran of countless tropical colonial battles freezing to death in the mountain snows far from home. And we'll never hear those stories and mostly never think of them because we get fooled by the numbers. Look at this week, three huge offensives, soldiers in the millions fighting all over Europe, tens of thousands being captured at once. Just imagine how that even looks. 50,000 men dying in a single week in a single army. We get fooled by those numbers because we can't really conceive of them in terms of horror. So go back to the individual. Try to think of those men one at a time. 
the Russian soldier captured by the Germans, unable to speak the language, doomed to spend what remains of his life in a prison, the Hungarian soldier who's never even been to the mountains before but is now fighting in minus 20 degrees in boots with cardboard soles, wounded and stuck in no man's land and finally being eaten by wolves at night because that really happened. Every single one of the men involved in these campaigns had a story. So think of them, think of this. Three great offensives were being fought this week. There was nothing great about any of them. I mentioned pigeons this week as a means of communication, and if you'd like to see our... That was a perfect ending. A perfect final note to think about. That can kind of reminded me of Crash Course History. How... Uh, which, which Green Brother? Was it John Green? I think it was John Green did that was the host of that one. Oh, yeah. Hank is the science one. John was the history one, I think. I think. Um <laughs> but kind of remind gave me gave me a vibe like that where John Green always ended the videos with kind of like a question. A very a question to think of the guy you think. And I really like that they added that here for this episode. I doubt that it'll become a common thing in all later episodes because this war is so long and they're doing it week by week kind of a little harder to uh come up with a question that deep hitting like this every single week of this four year long war but i'm glad that they did it for this episode i think it was perfect i hope you guys enjoyed remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more and i will see you guys in the next video peace